we can still find spin situations in the headlines of international politics. The League of Nations will face now its crucial test. Maybe the most important matters won't be decided in the chamber, but beneath the curtains, even though there's no doubt that the conversations between the representatives of the different countries that are taking place right now in Geneva will decide in one way or another the fate of Spain and Europe. Good morning, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War in this channel and for the next years we will follow the Spanish Civil War week by week, its battles and the holocaust that it provoked. Last week we closed the last winter attempt by the Francoist forces to take Madrid. And with it, the nationalists will be forced to change their objectives, at least for a while, after the failure back in November and after the three attempts to cut the Coruña road and to encircle the capital from the north. It is already clear that the war will be long and bloody, and that Madrid, the capital, that salient that is a logistic nightmare for the loyalist forces, will be resisting for a while. Even though this week we'll have to take a quick glimpse at what is going on in the center, as in the quiet sectors of the capital some attacks and counterattacks succeed each other during this week. And in the south, K. Podellano continues the offensive that he started last week and that was aimed to seize the city of Malaga, only connected to the Republican zone by a small corridor. So, without further delay, let's go to the fray. We'll start a set in Madrid. We've already talked about the constant death toll in the quiet sectors of the front, and we've been covering the best we could a great number of minor operations that could be considered secondary to the course of war. Well, this week starts with one of those minor operations. As the 18th of January, the Hospital Clinico, the farthest point reached by the nationalist troops back in November, the place where the Ruti, the legendary anarchist leader, received his fatal wound, that place that was meant to be dedicated to save life and that was the scene back in November of the fiercest fight in Madrid, a building contested floor to floor and where not so long ago loyalist forces blew up a mine that buried alive a group of legionarios. Yes, the mythical, the symbolic Hospital Clinico is recovered this week, the 18th, by loyalist forces two months after it was seized by the Francoist attackers. But, as we've suggested a couple of minutes ago, the seizure of the mythical hospital did not change the overall situation in Madrid. Maybe a bit more important when it comes down to strategy are the heights of Cerro de los Angeles, near Getafe. You might remember that those heights were abandoned by Lister's troops back in November. Well, these heights will be recaptured this week, the 19th, by the Republican forces. But wait, that's not all, because the next day the Francoist forces will manage to recapture the heath. So, as with the capture of the Hospital Clinico, the situation really did not change so much in the center, even though each of those operations claimed their prize in lives. If in the center, we've been talking this week about operations that lead nowhere. The song in the south of Spain, it's not so different this week, but for another reason. The advance of the nationalist forces last week was so fast that now Capo's troops need their time to regroup and consolidate their ground without putting at risk their supply lines. The forces under Francisco de Borbón that last week started their advance following the coast and seized its first important objectives, among them Marbella, won't advance so much during this week and will consolidate the occupied terrain. And that may mean, as we already know, deaths. At the north of Malaga, the situation is slightly different, as Granada's garrison that departed also last week towards Malaga occupies this week Alama de Granada, its first objective of the campaign. The situation in the south is dire for the Republic. The number of troops available for the defense of Malaga and its nearby area ranges from 12,000 to 40,000. 
the difference between these numbers can make us understand the chaos down there. This huge number of militiamen should have with them, according to Van de Beaver, no more than 8,000 rifles. So this reduces even more the number of potential active fighters. And these troops have scarce training, little ammunition, and an abysmal lack of support weapons. According to Beaver, the Republican High Command was not expecting a full offensive toward Malaga. According to Bande, even if Valencia's government had been interested in sending troops to the area, that, that is not the case. This was not possible because the road to Valencia-Malaga was cut near Mutril. If the troops and supplies ready for the defense of Malaga are scarce and of poor quality, the situation does not improve when we reach the turn of the Loyalist commanders. Martinez Monge, chief of the Army of the South, took this new position last week, and within one week he has already substituted the commander of Malaga for José Villalba Rubio. We've talked about Villalba at the beginning of our series as he was the garrison commander in Barbastro, and allegedly did not join the coup because Franco had joined it. Well, Villalba Rubio, the man that was tasked with the defense of Mala, had no good relations with Martinez Monge, his superior, nor with his Russian advisor. Yet to be seen there, the Loyalist Navy, that ceded the initiative in the area, and we could even say the whole Levant coast to the Francoist Navy, with the modern cruiser Canarias roaming the seas, shelling Loyalist coastal populations and intercepting merchants. Last week, the Almirante Cervera and the Canarias shelled the Republican positions at Estepona and Marbella, and now they are roaming, together with the Baleares, prepared to support any nationalist advance. So, by the end of the week, and with the nationalist forces getting ready to get back in motion, the situation looks dire for the Republican forces. In order to relieve some pressure from Malaga, Martinez Monge will give the order by the end of the week for an attack against Lopera, Porcuna, Torre de Jimeno, Beas de Granada, and Itnayoz. These attacks will achieve little success, not endangering nor halting the Francoist offensive. Facing the Loyalist Stocking Force tasked with the defense of Malaga, there are almost 15,000 nationalist soldiers advancing in three columns, one from the south, another one advancing from the north, and a third one in reserve. If this force should not be enough to seize the city, 10,000 Italians will soon start to move from Antequera and Loja, threatening the city from the west and the northwest. With Italian troops comes also the Italian war material, and leaving aside tanks and artillery, 100 planes will be supporting Capo's offensive in a place where the Republican Air Force is almost non-existent. With a swift end to the war far away, Italian help has become fundamental for Franco's war effort. It was providential together with German help in order to get the first African troops to Spain and supplying the first Francoist movements back in 1936. And we have already talked in previous episode about the fact that Italy was carrying with most of the weight of the aid towards Spain, because Hitler did not want to risk in the international sphere before his Wehrmacht was ready. In fact, apart from all the substantial material Italy has been sending to Spain since summer 1936, in a report dated on the 23rd of January, so this week, the Italian Air Ministry counts 211 pilots, 238 specialists, 777 army officers, 995 sub-officers, and 14,752 soldiers in Spain. In fact, with all those troops already in Spain, and with more of them expected to arrive at the end of the month, in a meeting in Rome this week, Mussolini, Goering, and Ciano will decide that it's time to back up the Franco-British plan in order to prevent more volunteers to reach Spain. In fact, it seems that a non-intervention agreement is on the horizon, with a cost of £898,000 per year that will be divided between 27 countries. This non-intervention agreement foresees that Brits will control the Portuguese border and the wars from the French border to Cape Gata. France will be patrolling from Cape Bosto to the French border, the Spanish Moroccan coast, Mallorca and Ibiza. 
the Franco-Spanish border would be supervised by 500 observers under a Danish colonel. Germany would cover the Cape Gata to Cape Oropesa, and finally Italy from Cape Oropesa to the French border. Menorca was under Italian responsibility. We started our episode with a quote from the Spanish press regarding the meeting that are being held this week in Genoa. We will see during the coming weeks how this program is set in motion. In fact, with all these international movements, the Italian ambassador in Franco's Spain, Filippo Ampuso, will tell the 23rd to Franco that he should not expect to be aided forever. Franco will reply the next day asking for help, at least for three more months. Last week, we talked about some scepticism among the German and Italian commands regarding the Nationalist Army's capabilities, and this new plea for help by Franco may have an extra cost, but we'll talk about it next week. Remaining in the international sphere this week, the 18th of January, the Republican Air Force will bomb a neutral French buckling class destroyer that is traveling from Mallorca to Barcelona. Luckily for both the French crew and the Spaniards in general, the bomber will miss. In the rear guard this week, we have some interesting things for you. We could start with some developments on the nationalist side that are linked to a man, a man we already talked about. This week, with the perspective of a long war and thousands of motivated, General Franco creates in Burgos the General Directorate for the Mutilated. A corpse of this kind already existed in Spain but was abolished in 1932 by the Republican military reforms. The president of this reborn institution will be, and here is the man, Millán Astray, whom you can see in the photo. Astray, the founder of the Legion, had lost an eye, an arm, and was shot in the chest and also in the leg during the Rif Wars. But Millán Astray, even with a single arm, can do more than one job at a time. Because apart from being the president of this directorate, we already said back in October 1936 that he was the chief of the nationalist press. In fact, this week, as chief of the press, he will have the honor to found Radio Nacional de España, RNE. This radio will become, in the coming month, the principal radio of the nationalist Spain. And it is still today Spain's national public radio. Here, one of those at least curious things. Spain's public radio was founded by the Francois during the Spanish Civil War, Spain's media corporation by the same fellas during the dictatorship. How many institutions created by the dictatorship are still present today? And can an institution that was born with a clear objective and ideology, a radio that, spoiler alert, will be transmitting the German and Italian version of what is going on in Europe until 1943, be trusted? On the Republican rearguard, we have to talk about an episode that will continue next week. We already talked in our previous episodes that Aragon had more collectivizations than Catalonia itself, even if the anarchists came mainly from there. We've said that it was due to the fact that in the Catalan countryside there was already a trade union, Unió de Rabasaires, that was very strong. Well, this Sunday, 24th of January, a group of members of the CNT will try to force the entrance of one of his members into the council of the small agricultural village of La Fatarella. The peasants will manage to disarm the anarchists and will take a couple of them as hostages. After some negotiations, the anarchists will be set free. But the end of the story, a kind of a pillar of the Barcelona May Days, will be awaiting for us next week. Please. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring life to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, as these heroes already did, or offer us a coffee, this could also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible all together. Thanks for your attention, goodbye and salute.